Hi, this is Mark Birch with a quick revision of John Donne's selected poems. Here I'm going to be taking a look at uh, Love's Alchemy, but the title appears ironic. If alchemy cannot distill a pure essence in the form of the elixir of eternal life, then presumably love also cannot be distilled. Donne appears to mock the notion of a pure and eternal love. So let's have a look at the poem itself. Some that have deeper digged love's mind than I, say where his centric happiness doth lie. I've loved and got and told, but should I love get tell till I were old, I should not find that hidden mystery. Ah, it's imposture all. And as no chemic yet the elixir got, but glorifies his pregnant pot, if by the way to him befall some odiferous thing or medicinal, so lovers dream a rich and long delight, but get a winter-seeming summer's night. Our ease, our thrift, our honour and our day, shall we for this vain bubble's shadow pay? Ends love in this, that my man can be as happy as I can, if he can endure the short scorn of a bridegroom's play. That loving wretch that swears tis not the body's marry, but the mind's, which he in her angelic finds, would swear as justly that he hears in that day's rude horse minstrelry the spheres. Hope not for mind in women, at their best sweetness and wit, they are but mummy possessed. So a little bit of context. Alchemists attempted to discover the Philosopher's Stone and the Great Elixir. The first was regarded as having the ability to transform base metals to gold. The second had the ability to grant eternal life. Sometimes the Philosopher's Stone and the Great Elixir were regarded as identical. Alchemy was a serious scientific endeavour in the Elizabethan period, but it was one that produced or had produced no results, and Dunn was acutely aware of that. The poetic voice asserts that others have more experience of love than him. They've deeper digged love's mind than I. But this conceit of mining could convey that love is valuable, as well as something that's exploited. The alliteration of the hard D and the assonance of the sharp I could replicate the repetitive blows of a miner. So you get this D, I, D, I, replicating that pickaxe kind of sound. I might be chancing my arm with that one a little bit. But the image of mining is particularly apt, given that mining for gold parallels one of the principal pursuits of alchemy, the discovery of gold, or at least the attempt to discover gold through the transformation of base metals in alchemy. The reference to centric happiness may be an allusion to Ptolemaic astronomy. The Earth was the central sphere around which the rest of the universe revolved. And by implication, the central happiness of love is encircled by many other spheres or aspects of love. The image of digging down to the point where the centric happiness can be found is a claim made by some who have deeper digged love's mind, those more experienced lovers that Dunn was referring to. But the poetic voice casts doubt upon their claims. He suggests that such perfect happiness is unattainable. There's a parallel with alchemy here. Many alchemists worked long and hard to discover the Philosopher's Stone or the Great Elixir, but they proved unsuccessful. Their goals seemed unattainable. By the time Dunn was writing, he fully recognised this. And also, as he's claiming, the pursuit of pure centric happiness of love is also unattainable. The poetic voice asserts his experience of love. He may not be as experienced as some, those who have deeper dig love's mind, but he claims that even if he loved till he was old, he wouldn't find that hidden mystery of love because it doesn't exist. His past experiences and future experiences are structurally presented as extensive through the use of polysyndetic and asyndetic lists, given that these provide a sense of endlessness. So we've got loved and got and told, and then it's followed by the asyndetic, I love, get, tell. The use of parallelism complements this sense of endlessness, given that the verbs are repeated in both past and future tenses. The poetic voice's tone is dismissive and certain. His frustration is evident in the initial use of an exclamative, oh, it's impostural. Basically, all such claims are false. He then goes on to mock the way in which the alchemist will glorify the contents of his pot, despite the fact that it's not produced the thing that he seeks, the elixir. The pot's personified as pregnant, creating a smooth transition to the comparison with lovers that's to come. 
While the pregnant pot does produce something, hence its pregnancy, the product is accidental and not the desired product. It's dismissed as merely some odiferous thing, so basically something that smells. The lack of specificity created by the adjective some and the pronoun thing reinforce the sense of the product being useless and unanticipated. That adjective odiferous also, of course, renders it distasteful because it's smelly. The sense of the product being accidental is also conveyed through the verb choice, befall. Uh, this is something that's occurred rather than something that's been planned. The product may also be medicinal and it can therefore be of some good, but hardly worthy of glorification. Similarly, the lovers may get something from their relationship, but it's far from the thing that they wished for. The alchemist's elixir is parallel to the lover's rich and long delight, but the thing actually produced by the alchemist equates to the true product of relationships, a winter seeming summer's night. This summer's night that's winter seeming provides the sense of something that should be comforting and warm, but which feels cold. It's an inversion of the desired outcome, making it all the more unwelcome. Summer nights, of course, are short, perhaps representing the brevity of these relationships as well. It's far removed from the Petrarchan ideal of eternal love. In the second stanza, Dunn initially shifts to the first person plural pronoun, our. However, the reference of this pronoun is ambiguous. Is it men, lovers, skeptics, Dunn and his beloved? And does it really matter? Essentially, anyone who has pursued this idealised form of love is sacrificing an aspect of themselves. The use of anaphora complements the sense of a wide range of sacrifices made as a result of the pursuit of the ideal. All of these abstract nouns are lost in its pursuit. Dunn lists those things that are sacrificed in pursuit of the ideal of love. Ease or comfort, thrift or money, honour and time our day. The sacrifice is clearly profound because it's so wide ranging. However, all of this is sacrificed for a vain bubble's shadow, something ephemeral. Vain suggests pointless, while the metaphor of the bubble represents something short lived and fragile or empty. And this emptiness is rendered hyperbolic through the reference to the shadow. Dunn suggests that it's less significant than a bubble. It's the pitiful absence of light that a bubble casts. Dunn rejects as ridiculous the idea that love can be found in the physical. If that was the case, his man, a low status servant, would be able to attain the same state of happiness as himself, uh, you know, a sophisticated man about town. All that his man would need to do would be to suffer the short embarrassment of the marriage ceremony the bridegroom's play. He dismisses this as unreal through that reference to play. It's not a profound union of the spirits, but something artificial. Dunn imagines a man in love who swears that he marries for the spiritual connection rather than the physical. He mocks such a man as a wretch because he's self-deluded when he claims that this is what makes the woman angelic. He skillfully extends the image of the angelic by referencing the spheres, which in medieval cosmology were controlled by an angelic presence. And he refers to the music of the spheres, the beautiful but inaudible sound believed to be produced by the celestial spheres movements. And then Dunn plays with this. He states that such a wretch would just as vehemently claim that he hears the music of the spheres in that day's rude horse minstrelsy. So we've got to decide what this is. That day seems to refer to the wedding day referenced in the bridegroom's play. So Dunn may be suggesting that the wretch, the kind of person who idealises his wife as angelic, would also regard the kind of tuneless performance of the wedding band as the music of the spheres, because they are so hyperbolic and idealised. He could, however, also be referring to the sounds produced during the sex of the wedding night. Again, there's this sense that the base and the physical is being idealised unjustly. It's 
fantastical, ridiculous. A final bitter couplet focuses on the women themselves in order to dismiss the notion of spiritual love. Dunn warns not to hope for the spiritual in women. While they can, at their best, possess sweetness and wit, they are mummy-possessed. So Dunn's likely to be punning on mummy in the sense of mummified, they're spiritually dead, a thing that's purely physical. But mummy could also refer to mother. Women, through the physical, become mothers and this role will possess them, re relegating the lover to a lower status in her affections and rendering the notion of the spiritual union nonsensical. So let's just finish with a little bit of structure. In terms of the stanzas, we've got two 12 line stanzas, which gives a clear sense of division, perhaps between man and woman, or perhaps between the idealists and the realists, or indeed between those that uh, focus on the spiritual and those that focus on the physical. The meter is largely iambic pentameter, but we've also got a little bit of trimeter in there and a little bit of tetrameter. So we do have regularity, but it's frequently undermined, just as the notion of eternal spiritual love is undermined by Dunn. The shocking brevity of line six complements the powerful emotions that were expressed there. And finally, the rhyme scheme. Um, as you can see, we've got rhyming couplets most of the way through this. And that regularity complements the sense of division found in the stanza lengths. OK, thanks so much, folks. Take care. Bye.